Hey, Mike here. So I have not been on the YouTube circuit in a while. I did a couple of videos here last year and uh, I wanted to do a little update on some of the projects I've been working on. So this video is about two-phase thermosiphons. Uh, there's a whole playlist that goes after this, uh, which is a bunch of videos I took for mostly for personal use and for another guy I was working with. So uh, there's not a lot of detailed uh, explanation of what's going on in there. So I want to do a little introductory video if anybody is interested in um, two-phase thermosiphons. Uh, Peltier devices too, thermoelectric coolers, but I didn't really do a lot of work specifically with those. Mostly this is all about two-phase thermosiphons and how to dissipate uh, heat effectively, to, to build a heat transformer to take heat from a very uh, high heat flux from a small area and convert it into a lower heat flux over a large area and dissipate that uh, heat into the environment, into the ambient environment. So. Um, kind of done with the project. Uh, it encompassed, you know, maybe eight months or something last year of uh, planning and thinking and building and toying around and doing a lot of uh, testing, iterative testing over and over and over again. Um, the the crux of the project comes down to uh, building a, a small refrigerator that is DC powered, uh, specifically from photovoltaic panels, um, and that does not use batteries, chemical electrical batteries. Uh, this is to be used in a warm environment like on the equator um, and to be as low cost as possible. And you know maybe there's some interest in doing this as a business long term but really I'm not interested in business. I'm interested in the project, I'm interested in building things, I'm interested in sharing those things. And um, refrigeration is a very niche interest and two-phase thermosiphons is ultra niche so I'd be surprised if really anybody contacts me about this video at all but uh, it might be useful to some people out there. Two-phase thermosiphons have been used um, for decades in, in various industries um, but I don't see a lot of people just toying around and building things like this very often um, other than just for fun. I, I actually wanted to apply this to something and although I haven't really done anything practical with it I learned a lot uh, along the way and a lot about uh, heat pipe technology, uh, about sintering processes, about different types of uh, um, uh, materials to increase the surface area and increase thermal conductivity, uh, nucleation, things of that nature. So anyway, um, I'm going to go over some of the different things that I figured out and the reasons for the project here and some of the, the manufacturing techniques that, that uh, I either discovered or developed or toyed around with because uh, most of this is all copper because that's, that's my medium, that's what I like working with. It's soft and malleable and uh, great, great, great properties. So, um, back to the refrigerator. So, this all stems from the desire to use Peltier devices uh, for a refrigerator. It's a really difficult thing to do. Um, there are some out there. You can go buy cheap ones at you know Walmart or whatever that will you know keep temperatures down you know 30 Fahrenheit below ambient, whatever it is. But um, they're inefficient as all hell. Um, and the reason is because they're very thin, small wafers that when you pass a DC current across them, they will pump heat from one side, move heat from one side of the wafer to the other. Now. Um, some of them might do that rather efficiently, but the problem is the heat leakage back across it. Uh, because they're so thin, um, if you start pumping heat from you know, this side to this side, um, eventually you reach a point where uh, the temperature difference across them is great enough that the heat flux back across from uh, the discharge side to the, the, the source is, um, is as equal to the rate at which heat is being pumped across. And at that point, the thing's at saturation and you're not doing anything at all, you're, you build a heater, essentially. Um, so <clears throat> you can get higher temperature differences by stacking the things, but uh, the coefficient of performance starts to drop off dramatically. So um, if you wanted to try to utilize these things, um, in this case for a solar DC refrigerator, you would have to uh, dissipate that heat um, very effectively and get that heat away from the Peltier device as quickly as possible and keep the temperature down on the device um, as, as much as you can. Now you could do this actively, you could do this by um, pumping a, uh, a, a cooling medium against it, um, but that would require a pump, um, presumably a fan. Um, and the amount of heat flux coming out of one of these things could be, you know, it could be 100 watts, it could be 200 watts, it could be quite a bit. Um, and uh, it would be really difficult to try to absorb that heat effectively and uh, with the pumping power and, and really still the poor performance of the uh, Peltier device you'd need a lot of solar in order to cool a small cabinet especially in a hot environment. Now beyond that 
um, the interest was in, to avoid using chemical electrical batteries. Um, the reason being is that they're expensive and they uh, uh, have a finite lifespan. So w with a chemical electrical battery, you would be able to charge those during the day and run your, your refrigeration system to cool down your cabinet. But then at night, uh, the sun goes down, the PV panels aren't producing any, and then the extra stored energy in the electrical battery would run the Peltier device. Um, not really an option, not really of interest, because the interest was try to keep this thing as cheap as possible. Um, and as I'm told, PV panels are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, so uh, thermoelectric devices might actually, thermoelectric coolers, Peltier devices, might actually make some sense um, by just throwing an extra solar panel on the thing, even though the COP is piss poor. Um, still wasn't really that crazy about the thing, but um, it gave me an opportunity to apply a technology that I've been interested in for a while, which is a two-phase thermosiphon. Um, if uh, anybody's watched this video this long, they probably already know what a, th a two-phase thermosiphon is, and they probably know what a heat pipe is. Um, so with trying to get this heat out of the cabinet, um, it's not just that you want to get it out, you want to prevent it from coming back in as well. So if this device is going to be running for say eight hours during the day pumping the heat out, and then the remainder of the day when the, the, there's not enough sun to run the thing, um, the high ambient temperatures, you know, 30, 35 Celsius or something outside, could leak back into the fridge. And of course we don't want this, we'd have to pump that heat back out the next day. Um, and in order to maintain our temperatures in the cabinet, um, uh, near refrigeration temperatures, I mean, let's say, you know, 10 Celsius or below, we almost have to have some kind of a thermal battery, a phase change material, ice, you know, a, a, a solid liquid um, uh, uh, refrigerant. So um, um, it's doubly bad because we don't want the heat to leak back to the cabinet, but we also don't want to undo all the work that we did to try to freeze this, this, uh, this ice or this phase change material during the night. And uh, heat pipes tend to have this problem where they will uh, conduct heat from the hotter side to the, the cooler side, um, much like any piece of uh, copper or anything else, any piece of metal that's going to move heat from the hot side to the cold side. So what we need is a, um, a check valve, essentially. Um, not a mechanical check valve, but uh, like a thermal diode, um, a one-way thermal uh, conductor such that it conducts heat very well in one direction, but essentially blocks it going the other way. And that's where a two-phase thermosiphon comes in. Um, now there are some thermal diode uh, heat pipes that are out there. Um, I don't know about them being manufactured, but um, there are certain ways that you can you can limit you know conduction in one direction more than the other. Um, but the other thing heat pipes kind of have going against them is the sintering materials, the wicking materials in there that have to return the uh, liquid phase back to the evaporator. Um, it's kind of beyond the scope of what I really want to be able to fool around with where I am. I don't have an oven I can do that with. It would take a lot of work and a lot of time to learn uh, that centering process. So basically forget you know heat pipes and move into two-phase thermosiphons. Now the neat thing about a two-phase thermosiphon is you don't necessarily need a wicking material um, because the liquid return is uh, essentially by gravity in almost every case. Um, for what I'm talking about here, it's 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 by uh, it's by gravity. So it's a density difference between the vapor and the and the liquid. Now, <clears throat> this thing is a, uh, a a loop whereby you have an evaporator that is in contact with the Peltier device. Now, the Peltier device, as I said, has a lot of heat flux in a very small area. So the first thing we have to do is to get that heat uh, effectively from the ceramic surface of the Peltier device. Um, through my material copper and into my refrigerant, which in this case is it's methanol. This is just heat bought at the automotive store here. It's mostly methanol. It's probably a little bit of water in there, but it seemed to work rather well for me. Um, it was the refrigerant choice for me because it was low pressure. In fact, it works in a vacuum, um, which was necessary for the design of my evaporator, which is flat um, because it has to be in good contact with these little, you know, say 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter Peltier. Um, uh, chips that are very flat, very smooth, and to get that good uh, conductivity, uh, I had to clamp or bond these things to the flat surface of a, of a, a copper vessel, and then use a, a conductive paste, um, which I just bought at Fry's Electronics. Now, 
Um, so that more or less takes care of that. I have to have this nice flat surface that's sanded smooth. Uh, this one's a little corroded here. I think this was, I don't think this one was ever going to be used right here. Um, and then that heat needs to get into the refrigerant. Now that refrigerant can lay flat horizontally on here and absorb that heat and then evaporate. Um, however, I wanted to kind of increase that that uh, surface area a bit if I can. So, you know, in this case here, this one's been torn open. This was an early one here. This is made out of a piece of two inch copper pipe as pretty much all of these are. And they were annealed and uh, expanded and flattened on a, uh, a metal mandrel, if you will, just a flat bar series of flat bars in order to get this this shape that I was desiring um, and then they're sanded smooth there so you can see that there is a material in here it's a piece of copper screen um, that was actually held against the bottom to try to um, uh, increase nucleation and try to um, uh, increase the conductivity from the copper to the uh, liquid and then once those um, small vapor bubbles were produced, you want to get those things out of there as quickly as possible because they're going to tend to lead to superheating inside and that uh, uh, gas is going to uh, basically take up space on the copper surface where there should be further heat conduction between the copper and the, uh, the liquid to cause it to vaporize. Um, so I experimented with a lot of different materials there. Um, now, of course, uh, two-phase thermosiphon isn't limited to an evaporator like this. this. This type of evaporator, I think, actually increases the challenges of a two-phase thermosiphon quite a bit. However, for this application, I required something that was very smooth. Um, so I got to, uh, to think about and to explore a lot of different types of materials. But a two-phase thermosiphon can simply be constructed with a, a copper loop, you know, tubing uh, evaporator if you want. So, so whenever that, uh, that liquid uh, evaporates, it increases the vapor pressure inside the entire system. Now, because this thing is a loop, we have an evaporator, we have a, a, a riser tube that goes to the top of the condenser, and then from the condenser, it, we have heat dissipated to the environment, um, the vapor is at a higher temperature than the environment. Um, in this case, I have an active fan that blows air across the condenser, which condenses the vapor back into a liquid. That liquid then descends and falls down the, uh, the return tube or the downcomer, whatever you want to call it, and then is deposited back into the evaporator for further, uh, for further heat carrying. Um, typically, and I found in my experience, that you should have some kind of a trap between the downcomer tube and the evaporator because the vapor pressure inside of the evaporator is slightly higher than you're gonna find in the condenser or in the return tube. And in order to ensure unidirectional uh, uh, vapor flow, liquid mass flow, you, uh, you wanna have some kind of a trap such that it fills full of your refrigerant, liquid refrigerant, and the vapor pressure inside the evaporator is not allowed to push backwards up through the return tube, so you have this unidirectional flow. Now, um, as I said, I explored a couple of different uh, evaporator types. Um, in fact, this was the very first one. This is actually the entire assembly right here. Um, this thing was designed to be vertical. This is two pieces of, of uh, copper pipe actually that had been annealed and flattened and then there's a separator in there, it's a piece of capillary tubing so it forms a void. Um, anyway, it had a liquid return in the bottom, it would evaporate here, it would have a riser. This was actually my condenser which is all handmade out of out of tubing and pipe uh, to form kind of a radiator there and uh, it was a it was a terrible uh, <laughs> terrible device. It was very very poor. I think I had like a 45C, you know, rise in temperature here at like 150. It was, it was, it was awful. Um, largely, I think I, uh, I soldered everything down here and used flux. There was contamination. It was a disaster. I uh, very quickly moved on to something else, which was a horizontal design. Um, this is still a piece of two-inch pipe. It's flattened on the bottom. The top still has a curvature that really doesn't matter because heat was applied to the bottom. Um, heat was applied with little cartridge heaters um, that were embedded in an aluminum plate that served as my, um, my thermoelectric stand-in, we'll say. So I could control the amount of heat input and then monitor the temperature um, of the block to see how effectively I could cool it at various wattages. Um, this one actually used um, copper scrubbing pads from the dollar 
dollar store. Um, they're very corroded right now because I think I also had some flux issues with this one. Um, and it's been exposed to the air and moisture in the air for some time. So um, it was definitely a huge.